Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the National Press Club here in uh, Washington, D.C. I'm Jeff Salingo. I'm a uh, contributor at the Washington Post, where I write about uh, higher education. Um, and I love being in academic audiences because I also have two academic appointments, one as a professor of practice at Arizona State University and also as a visiting scholar at the Center for 21st Century Universities at, uh, at Georgia Tech um, uh, in, uh, in Atlanta. My job today is to be the moderator for this discussion and the best moderators usually stay out of the way and just uh, direct traffic a, a little bit. Um, uh, my job is to try to keep the conversation uh, going um, and for the reporters in the room, um, I will try to keep my eyes out. So if you have questions on the topic we're on or you feel like we need to move on to a related topic, um, just raise your hand and get my attention. Uh, we're going to try to cover as much as we can um, in, the next, uh, in the next hour. Uh, we have a number of, uh, of hot topics, um, so we want to try to move as, um, as quickly as um, possible. So I am going to open up with something that has been in the news uh, just in the last couple of days from the Pew uh, Research Center. Uh, which found that uh, for the first time, um, uh, Republicans say that colleges and universities are one of the reasons why things are going wrong in the country. Um, this is a question that they ask uh, every couple of years about faith in different uh, parts of the system, everything from the media, which of course always gets bad marks, uh, to other institutions um, in the US. And for the first time, um, and quite dramatically over the last couple of years, um, uh, Republicans uh, uh, blame uh, colleges and universities for partially what's going wrong in the, in the US. And so I wanna, um, you know, kind of concerns about higher education, whether it's uh, the politics on campus, uh, student unrest, uh, uh, the cost of higher education, it's kind of always been kind of a constant theme uh, in, uh, in US politics, whether at the state level or at the federal level. But the idea of, of, of research um, has always kind of been walled off uh, from many of those discussions, right? Uh, we think that uh, US institutions are, are preeminent um, in the world in terms of their research capacities, um, in terms of graduate and, and, uh, and, and graduate and PhD uh, education. And so one thing that I was wondering about from the, uh, from the folks at the table is that in this era of increased um, uh, polarization and politicization of almost everything that is happening right now in the country, is there a concern that um, kind of this, this negative view, this very dim view, especially by one political party that happens to be in, uh, in power here in Washington, is there any concern that that will start to roll over to the other parts of the university that have been walled off, namely, you know, research uh, uh, and scientific research in particular? Um, any concern about that, number one? And number two, if so, what should or what could colleges and universities do to, to combat that? And to say, yes, we have these roiling uh, debates on campus about politics. Yes, you might think we're too expensive, but we still do all this um, world-class research. Anybody want to take that question? Start, yes. Sarah. Um, I'm Sarah Nesser from Iowa State University, and we are a public land-grant university. And what that means is we were started with the express purpose of translating knowledge from uh, our discoveries to the people of Iowa and to industries in Iowa. And, th and that has been our mission throughout uh, our last 160 plus years. And so when we talk about uh, concerns about uh, uh, campuses not contributing to society and being trouble points, I would point to the fact that research is integrally connected to both education and um, outreach and engagement with our people and businesses in Iowa. And Therefore, it is, uh, it is a way in which we contribute to society um, and it demonstrates our value. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Yes. Jean. I'm Jean Hassenlop from Marquette University. And we are a private institution. We are, come out of a Catholic and Jesuit heritage. And we understand that everything is under scrutiny today. Um, nothing is walled off anymore. People are going to be looking for the value of all of these activities. Um, one of the things where research 
is less un well understood by some of the public is who's doing the research on a university campus. And so to be able to articulate the impact on our students and on, in bringing the community into some of these research efforts is I think a really critical piece of making sure that we're able to continue to fund and do the work that's so important. And do you think that higher education does a good job of that? Do you think the universities do a good job of that? Or do you have to have a different kind of playbook now, a different strategy, a different approach? Eric? Well, I, I, would, um, I think there is a different approach. I think universities, I'm, I'm University of Chicago, the executive vice president for research, and we're a private institution in Chicago, uh, deeply committed to um, both a rigorous education and, uh, and research. Uh, in particular, I think universities and colleges have to step up in a way that scientists have also not stepped up, which is to really, uh, really communicate. I think we have not done a great job. We've sort of assumed that being universities, that, uh, that people understood what we were doing. And if you think about the education, which the advantages and benefits of education, I think people understand that. But I think less so they understand the impact of our research and the research has had, we've heard just two opinions on this, but I think the universities and colleges have to step up in a new way to communicate how we do what we do. And, and who does that? Is it the individual um, scientists? Is it other people at the university? As you know, it's, it's, um, there's a lot of risk to um, stepping into this uh, media maelstrom right now and the political maelstrom, right? Um, you, could, you could get pretty, pretty taken in and, and damaged pretty quickly. Well, Yep. History. I mean, there was a time when, if you, if you, the, the, the great example, of course, is going to the moon. There, NASA had a, a, a almost exclusive relationship with Life magazine. I remember I grew up looking at these great pictures. There was this great relationship which benefited both, and the communications were just phenomenal. Since that time, which is already deep in the 60s, we just have not picked up, the scientists in particular, because uh, we're talking about research more broadly, but also universities, I think, have not really picked up that same level of of clarity and communication. And I think that's really what we have to do as uh, institutions, but also as researchers. Yeah, yeah, other thoughts, Robert and then Grace. This is Rob Clark, University of Rochester, uh, Provost and Senior Vice President for Research. I, um, I think the messaging is important, but I also think the audience is important. I, I remember as a young faculty member attending conferences, and sometimes you felt like it was a group of professors just talking to other professors. And I think one of the things that we as institutions have to be cognizant of this is that the general public doesn't always broadly understand what we are communicating. So I think bringing that message forward in ways that affect the lives of everyday people is really important. So I do think that we need to communicate more, but I think we need to be very attentive to who we're communicating with. Grace. So I'm Grace Wong, I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development at the State University of uh, New York system. And we have 64 campuses and enrolled over 465,000 students right now. And so every three people in the state of New York, uh, they will, one of them <coughs> will have something to do with SUNY one way or another. And so we are impacting many of the families, many parents and students. So this question about the negative uh, impact, negative uh, feedback about higher education is of concern. And we think it's very important that we communicate the impact of science and, and also communicate the impact of science from a perspective of culture change. Is the basic research not only leads to the technology advances, and also changing our day-to-day -day life and generate economic growth. But more importantly, the spirit of basic research and also the innovation uh, helps us to understand the world, explore the uncharted areas, and also make the impossible things possible. We need to get that spirit out through our communications, through the culture change, so that and the students and parents and the general public understand the impact of science and also impact, understand the impact of the science, scientific and engineering research moving forward to our culture and to the health and the prosperities of our society. But again, I guess I, guess I go back to this how, right? Um, I mean, we're living in a very different era now, uh, not only in terms of communications, but in terms of politics. And it seems like the old kind of playbook doesn't work anymore, right? So uh, I go back to how do you talk about science and research in a way that will exhibit to people that this is kind of helping everyday, everyday living? Yes. There's so uh, we've talked about communication. But I think there is a realignment or a, a response from the university needed as well 
And certainly at Purdue, um, I, think, I think we all have heard that over the last six years, Mitch Daniels, our, our president, has frozen tuition. So I think the responsibility of the universities go beyond simply um, talking about the good things we're doing, but to take a look at ourselves too. Um, I think affordability and accessibility are, are very important to the, uh, to the citizen, to the general public, and to the extent that we can control our costs and uh, make it more affordable for uh, the population to attend university, uh, I think we help ourselves in the process. And in terms of, um, like Sarah said, Purdue is a proud land-grant institution. We believe our mission is to serve and, and bring um, sort of the fruits of science and engineering to the, to the people. So I think those that are actually receiving it, um, you know, companies that we partner with and such are very important um, partners in that messaging too. They receive a lot from us and I think we should count on them to make that case for us. Um, Stephen, you can make your point and then I want to move on to a, a related question. Uh, I'll be <clears throat> very short then. Uh, getting back to your original question about the Pew report, which I have to admit that I haven't read yet. Uh, we're in a state that has a Republican governor, a Republican dominated legislature, two Republican senators, and I've witnessed that they've all been very supportive of higher education, of the university system of Georgia, of which Georgia Tech is part. And I think one of, one of the reasons for that is the product of our university and the other 28 universities in our system is our students. And the students that we produce um, are phenomenal. And they're very valued in uh, industry, just as Sarah pointed out, in industries that are in our state that we're serving. So um, I look forward to reading that report and learning more. <laughs> so uh, there's been a lot of discussion in Washington on a number of fronts uh, around privatization uh, of a lot of public activities. Um, uh, and I want to kind of move on to kind of the idea of the role of federal research um, in, uh, in university research, or the role of federal dollars in, in university research. Uh, the first um, uh, Trump uh, kind of budget blueprint um, was not kind. Um, to the federal uh, research, uh, not kind is probably putting it in a very nice way, uh, to, um, to the federal research uh, 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 budgets, uh, especially for the NSF and the NIH. Um, I want to get a sense from, uh, from as many of you as want to comment on this, is one, uh, what, is, what do you think is the outlook uh, for the agencies, those agency budgets, especially those big agency budgets, over the next couple of years? Is this something that we'll continue just to see Congress continue to save? Um, and secondly, how about this kind of wave of, of privatization um, uh, around a number of other federal activities? Again. What is the, the role of universities in trying to explain the role that, of the federal university partnership that has been around for uh, quite some time uh, in, uh, in supporting research on your, on your campuses? So one is kind of a short-term outlook, and the second question is more, or the follow-up question is more of the long-term outlook for continuing this kind of federal uh, uh, university partnership around uh, research. Any of, any of the folks who haven't? Um, spoken up yet, Daniel or anybody down here? I mean, with a certain level of, of confidence, I, maybe I'm too optimistic, but, but uh, NSF and NIH funding have, have shown their stuff, their value uh, for decades, and uh, it's seen bipartisan support for, for years, and I just have to believe that that's going to continue. Uh, every dollar invested in uh, research in supporting the biomedical enterprise, in supporting basic science, have shown so much return on those investments uh, in terms of employment, in terms of discoveries, in terms of pipeline for industry to uh, develop new antibiotics, develop new vaccines, develop new cancer treatments. That that support is essentially bipartisan, so at least on the Hill. Right. Um, nevertheless, you know. Um, you have to be very watchful, um, and you know, going back to that earlier question, uh, not presume that all value is obvious uh, to everyone. Uh, clearly, it's not. This poll, I think that's what you're referring to, showing how a majority of Republicans uh, believe universities are part of the problem, is extremely concerning. Uh, it 
uh, I think it's another milestone in a push towards more anti-intellectualism that I've seen over my you know, 25 years as a kind of a newly adopted uh, American citizen. And it concerns me, it's part of a kind of tidal wave of uh, segregation of, of ideas, segregation at the class level. Um, we can do a lot of communication, improve that, but there are a lot of confounding effects there. Um, uh, they're social, they're socio-economical, um, and um, there's so much universities can do on that front, I'm afraid. Uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna take a village, it's gonna take uh, representative uh, and, and reaching out to, to those communities that feel disenfranchised from, from access to universities and, and, and the research enterprise in general. Daniel, did you have thoughts? Yeah, I'm, I'm Dan Lowenstein, I'm the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost at the University of California, San Francisco. We're a bit unique uh, compared to my uh, colleagues here in that we are laser focused on the life sciences and, uh, and healthcare. So uh, a, a huge amount of our efforts are supported through funding from, in particular, the NIH. I, I would simply say that the partnership between our universities, both public and private, and the federal government, which reaches back into the late 1940s, has been an example of arguably one of the most spectacular successes of, 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 our, of our country uh, in this, in this um, past era. Um, we are a beacon to the rest of the world when it comes to the productivity that's come out of this partnership. There's no one that does it better than we do. We, this, is, this is part of what makes America great. And um, I, I just hope that the, the political climate can see past these clouds and, and just recognize just how much has been accomplished through this partnership. And, and uh, the possibilities, in, in my opinion, are limitless if we can continue this kind and of And is effort. your view that the people who kind of matter in terms of, of appropriations and so forth get that? I, I, okay. I actually do. I agree okay. with what Dennis was saying okay. before. I, they, they see it. And, and, and again, I, I'm, I believe that they're going to be able to see through the crowd. The yes, uh, a question from Jeff at Science. the effort to cut back on indirect costs. I wanted to get your reaction to, were you surprised by that proposal from the Trump administration? Um, why do you think they don't understand the role that indirect costs plays and what are you doing to explain and to change their minds and do you think you'll be successful? That's a series of questions but it all comes, <laughs> down, all, to all comes down to indirect costs, right? Well, the uh, first thing is don't use the word indirect. Okay. They really are facilities and administrative costs. They're real, real. We need to explain them in real terms for us. I think is is really important. But yeah. Well, so, uh, when you said surprised, um, uh, you were being charitable in terms of uh, the response. I mean, shocked would be a better word because because all of us know that uh, if uh, if the uh, research infrastructure costs, which is what uh, these are, were uh, decreased to the degree that has been mentioned. It would, it would destroy the, uh, the university-based um, research enterprise in the United States. I, I don't see... Destroy. Uh, it, it would destroy it. it. It would destroy it. Absolutely. I mean, is, I don't know if anyone disagrees and, with that. Uh, no, certainly not. And, and going back to what Dan was saying, we, are, in addition to being the, the envy of the world, we are a great bargain for government to generate all these discoveries, we are the deal of the century. We are cheap. We can, you know, uh, through own sources, compensate for those uh, revenues that are already being cut as we speak before we're talking about further cuts. Um, uh, we've demonstrated through our discoveries, through advancing even entrepreneurship, for instance. Uh, but yes, going back to cuts in FNA, it'd be devastating to Johns Hopkins and most universities indeed. Uh, those costs are real. Uh, they ill-named in calling them indirect. Most foundations recognize this and we indeed uh, call them direct costs anyway. They support uh, the ability of our researchers 
to leverage uh, an environment, and it can be uh, an infrastructure, it can be uh, research facilities, so that they can do the great work that they can do. Uh, uh, private companies can, cannot afford it. They would have to bet on too many horses. We, in a way, de-risk for those companies uh, uh, the, their ability to not then develop, for instance, drugs and, and treatments. Um, uh, yeah. Gary, and then we're going to come back to Eric, who wants to add something earlier, and okay. then we'll go to a question from Paul. Yes, Gary. Okay, so I completely agree with Denny and, and Dan and what they're saying, Jeff. The second part of your question about what are we doing, this actually ties to everything we've talked about so far. For so long, it's been allowable for us as scientists and as administ administrators and researchers just to do a good job. Now the game has changed. Now we have to go out and advertise what we're doing. We have to take extra time. I have communication staff in my office. VPs for research never had communication staff reporting to them 15, 20 years ago. I've got a person who's just doing social media. I think most of us will be tweeting about this event today. But it's now on us at all universities to take time and to get the word out of the value that we're bringing to this country and to the world. Eric, you wanted to add something. I just wanted to come back to this question about, you know, about who's actually doing the research in terms of the longer term and shorter term research and this point that Dennis raises, which is if you, if you ask industry what kind of research they're going to do, they're not going to be able to do the long term research. Those days of companies like Bell Labs, I mean, even today when you look at the pharmaceutical companies, you look at how much long term research they're doing, it is really minimal. So if you start arguing, you know, F&A rates or you start arguing that the government pulls back on research, you really can devastate the whole system. It's really this, this really a virtuous system where you have this very nice balance. So, so I want to. I do want to say that I believe that the Senate and the Congress understand this. I believe that, you know, whatever is being said politically right now, you see it. You know, the restoring force comes back. I want to. I want to just want to raise one one last. Okay. I want to make one point. You know, talking about we're talking about medicine. I want to talk about security, and I want to go back in history again. You know, you can ask the simple questions. What would, imagine if the Manhattan Project were, were done by industry? If you imagine that that was something that we said, we farmed out and said, you guys figure out how to build a bomb. You guys figure out how to go build a nuclear power reactor. It just would not have happened the way it did. You're not going to get a private company to mount that kind of a massive campaign. So if you think about national security, which is becoming extremely important today, the only way, I think, to do it is through federal funding of, of universities. I, I just want Jeff may have a follow-up. Yeah. I mean, it was really, though, about, it was really a focus on overhead, though, wasn't it? I mean, it, it, the idea was that we could put some of this money back into what, in that case, the research. Obviously, there's a disconnect between how the two interrelate, but go ahead, Jerry. Well, I was just going to say, you're absolutely right. We have not been communicating very well until now if the president doesn't have an understanding of, and his people around him don't have an understanding of how it works. My point is the game has changed. We have to, it's a new paradigm for us. We're going to have to spend a significant portion of our time educating as well as doing the research and telling people why it's important and why we're doing it. It's not obvious. I, I think Suresh made a good point earlier, though, because he said, you know, it's not going to be enough for us to tell people what we're doing well. We need others to advocate, and that can include our corporate partners. It could include patients of our healthcare systems who've come in and benefited from a discovery that happened in the hospital. These personal stories of individuals are going to go much further with the broader public than us as senior VPs for research communicating to the public. So how we engage a community around that messaging is going to be really important. Okay. Uh, I want to get to a question from Paul Baskin from the Chronicle. Partly, Jeff kind of hit a lot on what I was going to, his second question was, was a version of what I was wondering because there was a lot of talk here about um, communicating and sort of confidence, underlying confidence that no matter what gets said, the Congress still comes out and, and you know, rejects largely what the President has proposed and that therefore things seem okay. But I think what, what Jeff was, in, his initial question was aimed at, I, I thought was sort of one, to what degree do you, do you uh, it's not just a, a funding issue, do you, do you, the, the whole notion that science can't be trusted or facts can't be trusted in this country, 
how worrying is that fundamentally? And, and I, I think Gary was sort of answering it to some degree by talking about you know getting out there with social media and really taking more seriously the need to do that. I, I'm I'm just wondering. I guess one is how many other people are doing that, and two is even that enough? I mean, do you really need to get a lot more dirtier in the weeds and really fight on the political level that this is being taken to you at? Uh, and and to follow up on something Paul just said is you know facts. You know facts are kind of under attack right now. In, in a lot of parts of our um, conversation in society and in the media. So even if you communicate something as fact to a news outlet, or even if you just communicate it on your own, the idea that it now will be trusted is not necessarily assumed, right? So um, perhaps there's just nothing you could do at that point, but, <laughs> but you are in the facts business. Um, and, and a lot of, especially you know, over the last year around climate science in particular, um, has come under attack in terms of, um, of, of fact-based um, reporting. And so communicating is fine, but when will you necessarily have the trust on the other side that what you're communicating is, is correct? What we're talking about is populism, right? I mean, we now realize this country has a rather large fraction of its population that is um, attracted to, you know, populist instincts. We thought the Russians just uh, were the alone in looking for father figures. We now realize that actually Americans are not that special. They're not that different from, you know, Europeans or, or Russians. We a large fraction of population is seeking easy solutions for complex questions, and the current administration is providing those easy answers, such as let's cut indirect cost. And it sounds right for two seconds until, of course, you do some digging and realize it's, it, there's a whole beautiful, uh, hyper competitive, complex ecosystem that uh, life science, in particular, that has evolved over time and has produced just amazing value to its population. But I feel like what keeps happening is you're rephrasing the question instead of answering it. Is that, I mean, that's, we understand that's the problem. I guess what I'm trying to find out is what's, what solutions are actively being pursued to do something about it. Yeah, um, Jean, uh, then we'll go to uh, Sarah, and then we'll come back to Eric, sorry. So one of the things about fact is what we think is fact and what the public hearing it could be two very different things. And so one of the strategies is to really think about how we're training people to go out and engage in these conversations, whether they're with our representatives or with the, with the public. An example is yesterday we had our external advisory board for a clinical translational science institute of southeast Wisconsin. It's eight partner institutions. There's a, a number of trust issues in the community around biomedical research. and we're really working to figure out what the most effective strategies are to engage and help people understand what the value of participating in clinical research is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have a science cafe program that's undergone multiple iterations to figure out how to make it effective, how to bring families in as a hook to get people into it. Uh, let's go to um, Sarah and then we'll come back to Mark. I just wanted to say that the, the public actually trusts scientists. Uh, they, the, the context of science is generated out of the peer review process, the scientific method, public inquiry, and questioning of results. And so the fundamental base from which uh, facts are drawn uh, is very solid. And what happens is that uh, uh, information gets used in out of context uh, in ways that uh, uh, basically can misconstrue uh, results. Um, and in terms of solutions, uh, we also are interested in working with the community. And the one thing a land grant has available to it is staff that exist in every county. And so that there's a, a messaging that's going on between what's going on at the university on out to the public. And I think that, that uh, it will really be incumbent upon all of us to, to do more engagement with the community. Uh, Mark and then Eric. So I, <clears throat> I think the crux of the problem is uh, not uh, communication, but how we communicate. I mean, we, we historically have communicated to our peers for the most part. We have not really communicated as well to the public as we have to our peers. We get caught up in our own um, language and our own um, um, uh, research um, depth of questions, and we don't really break it down to where uh, we can try to explain to the public as a whole 
what science means to them. Uh, it's, the, it's the definition of fact that becomes the real problem, I think, at this point in time. Um, the, the, the public uh, doesn't trust science in this particular period of time because we haven't really spent the time to explain to them exactly how we break these things down into component parts and, and how that benefits them in the long run. Just to be clear, though, I think the public does trust science and scientists, although, you know, fake news is, 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 is part of, the, of course, the uh, kind of background here, but, but it's a mistrust of universities, and I think it's, again, confounding factors where it is these high-cost universities, is too many graduates going to the workforce, not finding jobs, and, and for-profit universities that have really uh, created all kinds of, of, of issues. And, and I think all those issues are confounded into a big magma of, 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 of so much unrelated issues that create some problems. I, I'm going to have Eric uh, pipe up, and then uh, we're going to move on to a different subject. And I do want to come back to this question of what we're actually doing. But um, let me just summarize what we've just said. I think scientists have tended to, to, to paraphrase, roll, up their, roll their eyes every time they hear it. People say things like, I don't believe it, rather than roll up our sleeves. And I think what's happening now, you know, we're seeing this at the University of Chicago. I see faculty come to my office, come to our federal relations office en masse asking, how do I communicate to Congress? How do I communicate to people? So there is a sea change because I think the pressure that you know, we're talking about is being felt by everyone who sees their research funding potentially evaporate. We're seeing our students, undergraduate students, are coming to my office and saying, just like I think is going on at Marquette, help us communicate. We want to communicate the value of universities. We want to communicate the value of research. So we're seeing that happen uh, more and more. And I think that's in response to exactly the pressures that, 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 you, that you raise. So that's one level. But the other thing that's happening, Gary mentioned, is I think all of us are spending a lot more time, in whether it's in the research offices or whether it's in the provost's offices or whether it's the president's offices, spending time asking questions. I think all of us probably have larger federal relations groups than we've ever had before. So we're all trying to communicate at different levels, faculty, students, and administrators at all different levels. So the, the way I think we get to the problem is we learn how to communicate better, because I do think it's communication and knowing your audience, but also trying to attack this throughout the whole ecosystem. I, I, so I think great advocates can be of students themselves. Uh, yes. In the room here, we have um, uh, Asini Jalatilakash, she's done you know, amazing work recently that's gotten a lot of coverage. She's going to be, you know, later today, meet with a uh, representative on the Hill. Uh, I think it can, could be still seen and construed as self-serving if our faculty go uh, and, and advocate for more research funding. I, I think our students, even our undergraduate students, could be great advocates. So I want to um, just kind of shift a little bit because the undercurrent, I think, of research, um, and, and some people even named specific things, has been around mostly biomedical um, um, research. Uh, and, and, and a lot of that does have fans on Capitol Hill, uh, especially of, of specific um, uh, diseases. But what about um, the rest of the, uh, of, of the research agenda uh, of the US, particularly energy and EPA and other things that may not be as um, sexy um, uh, and definitely not have a, a, an immediate impact to somebody on, especially on um, Capitol Hill or something that you can talk about your patients, um, for example. Uh, there's been suggested, um, uh, again, big cuts. There's been a lot of uh, pullback of research in, uh, in some of these agencies. There's been a proposal for a big uh, cut in, uh, in, in the budget for the EPA. So when we think about these other agencies, from space to energy to EPA, um, Daniel and others had a, a good outlook, I think, for NIH, maybe NSF, but what about these other agencies? Yes, yeah, Robert. Energy is an interesting area to raise because if you look at venture capitalists and you think about startups and, 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 and new venture creation, you know, the long-term return on energy, the, the time constant's much longer than, than some of the other uh, technologies, whether it be software development or those spaces. So you're not going to have the same level of interest in investing. So the federal government's investment in those kinds of sectors where you can't take a long view horizon, where people won't be patient enough to wait on the return. So it's what you're saying difference. is that the federal government has to do that because no one else will? I think that's the case. They seem to think Elon Musk will do it, but anyway. Yes. Um, other thoughts on that? Well, I, I would say uh, you're are, talking directly about Department of Energy. Look, yeah. Department of Defense, that's the other, the, other, right. the other agency, like the other white meat, uh, is 
not struggling. They've got a lot of resources. And what you see them doing is turning to a lot of the things that, that are in energy, because of course the military and security needs energy. You do see new, a, a lot of new fields coming to light. I mean, quantum computing is, is something that's been growing dramatically over the last several years, and I think that's still being supported. So there are still positive areas within the bigger thing. When you come to energy, it's going to be, I do think there's going to be a bit of a food fight in the next few years. When you see agencies like EPA, which is on the very applied side, obviously they're directly addressing environmental, but if you look at DOE and the Office of Science, it actually continues to get supported quite well by uh, by uh, by Congress. So every time, even with the president's cuts, you know, the same way with NIH, it comes back to roughly the same numbers, and the Department of Energy Labs continue to be funded at a reasonable level. Um, let's go to Sarish, and then we'll go to Stephen. So, so this issue really relates also back to Paul about, you know, what can be done, and we're reiterating the question, et cetera. I think part of it is not reacting to the issue of the day always, and that it's not as if, gee, you know, a skinny budget was released, and therefore we all need to beat up on it. First of all, the skinny budget is, is just a proposal, and I think certainly my conversations with our delegation and such uh, give me you know, great confidence that I think they get it. And uh, so on the other hand, I mean, the federal government does need to focus on cost cutting somewhere. This is a, effectively a cost cutting um, a sort of exercise, and they think uh, you know, FNA costs can be, uh, can be lopped off. I think part of the message that I don't believe has gotten across, it's a technical issue, but the fact that there are a lot of unallowable costs, right? If we were allowed to cost everything as direct costs, we would do it. It'll be more bureaucratic, more painful, more accounting, but we could, we don't have to um, spell out the FNA, for example. But to your um, later question then, I think it's important for us to build networks beyond what we do in engagement and extension and so on. I think um, have an active, and well-fed, as in well-fed with information, group of uh, sort of, whether it be the private sector or our delegation, I think if we stayed close to them and help them understand this issue before it became an issue, uh, whatever that issue be, uh, I really think that these things can be preempted to some extent. And again, uh, life sciences, yes, you know, Lipitor, Prozac, whatever, is an, an easier sell, but, um, you know, we've got Rolls-Royce in, in Indiana, and we work very closely with them. It's hypersonics and sometimes somewhat arcane uh, topics, which are of great interest to the public, cybersecurity, et cetera. Uh, and so I think our private sector partners, our governors, our state delegations and all are very good um, uh, sort of messengers of this, too. Stephen, I'll, I'll get back to you in a second, but uh, you know, a lot has, uh, uh, since we were talking about Indiana here for a second, and since you kind of have a pipeline to the vice president's office, I assume, um, uh, you know, a lot has been made of this administration's lack of um, people in it <laughs> um, at agencies at all levels um, in, all, uh, in all departments. Uh, so I guess the question is, um, is that a concern that a lot of these jobs are not filled or are not being filled, or I don't even know if there's an intention to fill them? And then I guess the question is, who do you talk to? Uh, you know, obviously you've been talking about Capitol Hill, but there's a whole staffing infrastructure there. Um, uh, but in terms of this administration, um, uh, what's going to matter in the next couple of years? Like what offices in your mind, uh, you know, is there a pipeline into the administration Perhaps maybe it is through Vice President Pence's office, uh, and given the president of Purdue is, um, you know, also a former governor of Indiana. Uh, but but where is it? Where is that pipeline? Yes, Sarah, and then Stephen. I yeah. know you have a yeah. So the point. the agencies still have a lot of staff. We have developed long term relationships with those staff, and and so this is the area that I think most of us are working with. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just wanted to go back to your prior question and point out that USDA is often not talked about in terms of research funding, but it's just fundamental not only to our food production, but also to the sustainability of our environment and rural economic development, which should be very important in today's political environment. Since Indiana came up, could I just take yeah. a quick um, shot at that? So I think um, it's certainly a, a problem that many agencies and many uh, departments are not staffed well. But that's a fact, so what do we do with it? Well, maybe it's an opportunity. Maybe we fill it with information that's not there from their regular staffing. And, of course, I text uh, Vice President Pence every morning, so if you want to give me a list of things, I'll send <laughs> 
Stephen, I, I, you, I think you had your hand up from an earlier question. So. A lot of the points that I were going to make have been made, so maybe I'll just summarize some of the things I've heard. And I want to put it in the context that it's not all doom and gloom, which is what we hear. Um, yes, we're concerned about the cuts in DOE and EPA, but I think science is going to be well-funded. And what a, what a wonderful opportunity for us to start communicating the impact of what we can do over the next four years. Shame on us if we don't do it. One of the things that isn't widely reported that the administration has said they want to do is cut some of the um, regulations and compliance things that have been driving us crazy in the university. Shresh mentioned the unfunded compliance and the reporting, increased reporting that we've seen in the past eight years. We have to cover the cost for that. We're not reimbursed for it. So having that go away should actually unshackle us in terms of being more innovative and entrepreneurial. Um, a lot of the positions aren't um, aren't filled, and that's a concern. But there's good people that are civil servants that are uh, in those positions. I've I've been impressed with the people I've talked to in OSTP um, in the past, and um, you can be very grateful that the NSF director and the NIH director are there. And they, um, Francis Collins, for instance, made a very great testimony in defense of facilities administrative costs recently um, in the Congress. I thought that was a br very brave thing to do. So there are good things going on too, but I, th I think the, the one kind of foot stomper that I've heard in this thing, it's really incumbent on us and the scientists in our universities that communicate better what we're doing with the money that the federal government entrusts to us. So Stephen said it's not all doom and gloom, and so now we're 40 minutes in, so I want to kind of flip to maybe something positive. So what does excite you most about um, what's happening in, in science right now, um, uh, whether it's on your campuses, whether it's broad, more broadly in science, you know, what are, what are the next frontiers that are, uh, are exciting you now and, and you think have potential to actually break through this, this noise and this log jam in, 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 in Washington? And Stephen, we'll go right back to you then, and then we'll go to Grace. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. I, I just relate a story from our university with our uh, biologists. Uh, so we have biologists who are, um, one, uh, John McDonald, who's an expert on ovarian cancer. Um, and he's kind of a crusty old guy. Um, and he's sometimes difficult to work with because people in my position um, are expected to support their research. And sometimes we can't do it at their levels of expectation. I saw him almost giddy and excited with some of the, the big data, the data science people that we've kind of, my, my job is to create collisions and then help reduce friction. So getting some of the computing people together, some of the biologists, and what they've done in the past two years has just been phenomenal. And it's created a lot of excitement and a lot of potential um, uh, new therapies may come out of that. Uh, so that's, that's been very exciting to see the interdisciplinarity pushed from my office and the impact of that. Grace. I also think is uh, the scientific breakthroughs in the last decade in the life sciences present a great opportunity for us uh, to leverage in many ways. And also in the recent years, the advances in uh, artificial intelligence, in machine learning, so present us tremendous, uh, very interesting, exciting opportunity to uh, connect the dots and break the discipline silos so that we can have a uh, new breakthroughs in many areas, actually, not only in life sciences in medical research, but also how to connect with the cities, connect with the day-to-day -day life. So it's not only breakthrough, it's not only economic growth opportunities, but also touch the day-to-day -day life and the day-to-day -day activities of everyone. And going back to the communicating science impact, we, uh, we need to do that in that way to really look at what is the fundamental profound impact of science to everyone's life. Yeah, and uh, any questions from the reporters? Just a raise quick your hand. Uh, addition, I think. So, I think one of the things that's changed a lot, I think we would all agree, is that the problems are far more complex. The the big uh, the challenges are a lot more complex. And so, not only life sciences and not only science, but uh, increasingly we're seeing you know political science folks collaborating with communications and anthropology and science and physics and so on. So we recently had a, a big idea challenge on campus. We had 47 groups self-assembled to apply for that funding. You know, we, we, we funded six of them. We'll nurture them through to success and hopefully do it again. And the NSF, as you know, is doing this big ideas thing as well. So I think you'll see more and more um, of these uh, groups that come across disciplines but go well beyond 
uh, engineering and science also, ag folks, food, you know, feeding 9 billion people, all of these things have a lot of policy issues as well. And I, I think you're seeing an, an enriching of the, of the pool of researchers that come to this. Uh, Mark and then we'll go back to Eric. I, I think the really exciting thing, this is Mark McIntosh from University of Missouri. I think the really exciting thing in science right now is, is really the culture change that we've seen over the last decade. And that is that science is no longer an individual sport, it's a team sport now. And what you see are, groups of scientists from various uh, uh, and different backgrounds really starting to come together to try to tackle some of these complex problems, not just on the campuses, but among campuses, and especially with uh, our um, uh, private um, um, and commercial uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, they are coming now to the campuses to really try to, to um, build an infrastructure, to generate big data, to tackle some of the, the, uh, the problems in biomedical research and energy research and so on. And that's really changed dramatically just in the last few years. Um, Eric, and then I have a, another question on a related topic. So I, I, I agree with these, these statements here. Some of the most exciting things are around this, this great uh, multidisciplinary work that's going on that's connecting bench science to economic development, not within 30 years or 20 years, but within two years. And that's extremely exciting to see benchtop studies, say, of the microbiome get into the gut and, and be a therapy within two years. But I do want to uh, redound back to something which is also incredibly exciting, which is that basic science still continues to produce amazing results. Just last year with the, the, the first observation of gravity waves, that was just a phenomenal thing. And those kinds of things, you saw how many, uh, how many uh, catches that got on front pages above the fold. And those kinds of events are rare, but it's great to see that they can still happen. And they're happening because there are large groups of people working together. You know, we're building these massive telescopes now that are 30 meters across in the desert in Chile, which are also going to allow us to look at things like, is there life on other planets? So these big kinds of fundamental questions continue to be unanswered and continue to give us incredibly exciting things. Um, so about uh, a, a decade ago or so, uh, when, um, when, when stem cell uh, research was in the, in the news every day, uh, and there was a kind of a political discussion in Washington here, kind of some of the states stepped up at that time. And, and I wonder, there's really no state uh, that has close to as much money as the federal government does, but I'm wondering, you know, many of you are public uh, universities. Do you see anything in your states or even among the privates at the table um, and I know that's definitely not going to be true in Illinois, but um, uh, do you see anything in your states where some of the states might pick up some of the, uh, some, uh, something on research where, um, where the federal government doesn't? Grace. So since you mentioned the stem cell research, and uh, of course, as you know, New York yep. is uh, one of those states actually step up and is to support the stem cell research uh, during that time. And right now, one of the... Um, topics we have been talking about uh, in terms of uh, uh, future funding uncertainty is clean energy. Mm -hmm. And so the, the governor of uh, New York announced uh, the, uh, his commitment to the clean energy uh, together with the governor of uh, California. And so it's, uh, we, we expect that uh, regardless, we will continue the clean energy research and continue uh, our commitment to a sustainable, sustainable future for the state of New York. I mean, I guess is the, is the state stepping in good news or bad news? Because again, there's not a lot of money there in any individual state. I mean, there's a lot of competition between the states, but that's probably not a plan, a good plan B in my opinion. But Globally, no doubt about contributions of university, sorry, of states into public universities' budget has been shrinking right. for, for decades. Uh, but there's still a partnership to, to, to be uh, sustained and, and hopefully you know, grow again. Uh, I, uh, Hopkins, being a private university, still you know, uh, needs a, a vibrant uh, state of Maryland promoting entrepreneurship, promoting you know, private public partnerships. We've seen it, we're incredibly grateful for it. Um, and, and yet at the same time, well aware that um, you know, we cannot count on it, we're gonna have to continue. Yourself, right. So yeah. this is actually I cultivating where, it. and it's been said by both Grace and Dennis, but where states and cities are really contributing a lot of work is where there's a great benefit to them. So there's a lot of pull on the entrepreneurial side. So there is, even in Illinois, <laughs> even in Chicago, <laughs> where my taxes just went through the roof. Um, it, even in, in the state of Illinois, there's a lot of interest by governors and cities to engage on areas of entrepreneurship, which 
as we've been discussing, is much closer to the basic research than ever. So there's a natural pipeline because cities are investing in, whether it's research parks, whether it's actual direct investments in transportation to various parts of the city that were previously unpopulated and now being developed as, as hubs of technology development. So the cities are actually becoming even better partners even than states because they have a very local, very uh, focused interest in universities succeeding in their, in right. their and neighborhoods. And mayors are, are big players. And that. mayors are big players. To separate that support, which is really focused on economic development, which is so important for the cities and states, from the funding for basic and research. Basic research, Because right. what the cities and states have been doing is bridging that gap that's identified as the valley of death of moving technologies and ideas forward in areas where the funding hadn't been there by putting those resources in the communities. And so they are, it's, it's needed, but it's not a substitute yeah. for that. What it does, though, and I will say where it does affect basic research is it allows us to recruit the best people. If you don't have those kinds of things going on, the students don't come as quickly and the faculty don't come as quickly. So when the when students see that kind of activity, when faculty see that kind of activity, it's 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 a game changer. Uh, yeah, I'm there's sorry. One yeah, more, let's go, uh, Sarisha, and then we'll come back to. Sorry. There's one there's more there's component to this too, and for one thing, the it's not an either or. So I think the states certainly contribute. Um, well, we, it never was an either or, but it's starting to become right. an either but or. But there's it the seems. private sector as well that adds a third piece to it. I think they each contribute in different ways, and I think we should just keep growing the pot. And um, the the I don't think any of them replace the federal the kinds of things the federal government supports. But uh, increasingly, as you know, large federal grants um, are requiring sort of partnerships with the state, and the state of Indiana has certainly been very. Um, productive in that. We're also, I think universities are increasingly looking at other m means of sort of funding work, funding buildings even to, uh, so we've got a public-private partnership, an innovation district where we expect significant contributions from private developers building things and making that available to Purdue. So I think we should continue to look for ways to broaden that, that base of funding. Uh, but it's the states are not going to supplant. I just want to federal. take a pause here because we have about uh, t 10 minutes left. So I want to make sure that if we get any reporter questions, that we get them in. Alan. Uh, yes, uh, I'm uh, Alan Kotoff with Science and Enterprise. Uh, what what uh, question for anyone on the? On the panel here, what effect has the uh, immigration crackdown? Good question. That was going to be my crack. next one. Immigration uh, crack, crack down had on your uh, uh, your uh, research activities or uh, recruitment of uh, students or scholars. Great question. So, so, so almost one out of four students at Purdue is an international student. Um, we believe that's a great, that diversity is a great richness. We think that it's um, what makes Purdue what it is. Uh, that's amongst our student population. Uh, and certainly all of us have uh, a, a very significant fraction of our faculty and researchers and such are, uh, are uh, our immigrants, uh, first generation or otherwise. Um, and so I think if there was one thing that the country should, it's a no-brainer, I would say, or a country should agree uh, to relatively easily is the value that immigrants or immigration brings. Uh, right, Mr. Rishi, we could say that, but, but obviously that's not the mood of the country right now, right? So how, and, and, and it's not necessarily the policies that are being developed here, and there's this policy that's being talked about earlier this week, right, that for, for visas, they would have to kind of, kind of renew them every, every year, right, which I think probably, I would imagine, would love thoughts on this, that would probably really impact um, international enrollment. So, so right now, it seems some of this is perception, because there's not a lot of stuff being put in place, but if the stuff being talked about is put in place, um, you know, we, you can all say that this is a great thing for U.S. research, but... Um, there's going to be practical implications here. Kind of going back to the previous point, this would be destructive, period, mm -hmm. right? This would be a disaster. Um, and I'm hoping that these are sort of trial balloons and things that, that go away. But I think we should 
as speaking of um, sort of messaging and communicating and all that, I think a quick thought experiment about all the things that would disappear from the United States if there weren't immigrants uh, and their contributions, I think we should, we should uh, you know, double down on that. Yes. Sure. I think we'll see in the fall what, what the real impact is going to be. Uh, you mean right, in terms of who shows up? Who shows up, yeah. right. And sometimes that's not necessarily because they're banned, but by how welcoming they perceive us to be. Uh, certainly the conversations we've had on campus with some of our researchers uh, has been that they're challenged by the climate nationally right now and are concerned about their long-term status, whether it's you know, long-term meaning the next year even. Um, and so there's a, it's engendering some fear among our researchers. Now, you know, some people will argue, though, that maybe this is the time when U.S. institutions could kind of step up and start to develop kind of internal talent, U.S. talent, right? So a lot of this has been, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, um, you know, some of the backlash in the states has been, you know, especially public universities have gone after uh, large numbers of international students, um, both at the undergraduate, graduate, and, and PhD levels, and, and have you done enough to develop talent, especially in the STEM fields, um, in, the, in, the, in the U.S.? Can I follow up quickly yeah. on that? Um, I think developing talent from the U.S. Is, is really important. We do a lot of pipeline work, but science is a global enterprise. And well, I'm not arguing that's right. not a global enterprise, but I right. think one but of the things is, is that right. have we that's done right. enough as higher education to develop that pipeline, which, as you know, takes a very long time. It takes a long requires time. Requires cooperation with K-12 and all these other things, so it's just easier to bring somebody from overseas. Well, I think we're doing both. Okay. Right. Uh, we have to do both. Yes. So that's actually, there's a synergetic effect from uh, just have a very diversified talent pool. So yeah. it's a, and it's, it's our job to attract all talented people who can uh, study and work here to help with our um, scientific and uh, scientific engin engineering research. So we have to do both. Sir. Yeah, so uh, I think most universities have quite an active uh, program in terms of reaching down into the schools of our states. And I know Iowa State has NSF funding for this in order to raise up ta talent from our younger people. But I don't think it's going to be enough. We have to remember that after World War II, we brought lots and lots of scholars and students over to the U.S., and that had a huge impact on our innovation. Yes, sir. So, so far, University of Chicago has not seen this impact, but like Jean said, probably in the fall, we'll start seeing what's going to happen. But I do want to remind ourselves that uh, in addition to what you just said, which is that we've always been an attractor, and, uh, and this could have a damping effect on attracting great talent, the science we do is very international. And the ex one example, we run two national labs, one of them being Fermilab, which is building the largest source of neutrinos in the world. That's inherently an international project that's going to involve dozens of countries, and if we put a chilling effect on our willingness to collaborate, uh, that'll have an impact on the ability of our, of our scientists to do science globally. So it's, it's, it's going to have a, a knock-on effect. That if we stop allowing people into this country, it's also going to feel like we're trying to uh, withdraw from the, the world, and that's going to, I think, have a real effect on And is on your biggest concern about students, kind of the, um, the students who haven't been here yet, in other words, your, your first time um, students, or what about um, returning students, faculty, other things, or uh, when you say this fall, is it really about the, the students who have applied, been accepted, will they show up? Um, but what about um, a returning students and, uh, and faculty? Yeah, uh, yeah. Absolutely, this is part of some of the students we're worrying about, uh, our faculty as well, having more and more trouble uh, renewing visas, uh, which were routine and all more and more difficult. We have to remember who are those students, who are those faculty or international. They're people who have options. Right. They are very most talented people who have options with the UK, Australia, Europe. Uh, you're hearing from uh, the French prison, from the British prison, you know, basically telling us, hey, if you're not entirely happy with the American uh, experience, maybe you ought to, to consider either coming back or, or actually simply moving. And uh, I I we are in a hyper-competitive uh, environment where uh, faculty and students will gauge the options and then pick for what's you know, best for themselves. Uh, we have to be competitive, and one of the ways to remain competitive is continue, you know, 
being this welcoming place where you can thrive, you can make it and stay on and contribute to. to well, what would be interesting, I think, is if nothing actually changes substantively in terms of um, uh, rules and regulations, but just because of the conversations, whether that has enough of an impact um, on this. Yeah, and Robert, why don't we uh, go to you, and then if there's anybody else who has something burning to say, otherwise we're going to wrap up. I'm yes, just going to say, I think, you know, one of the great American pastimes of baseball, it'd be hard to find a baseball team that didn't have an immigrant on the team, but and we want to put the best teams we can in the world together right here. And so we want to do the same thing with scientists and engineers. We want to build the best teams we possibly can with any any of the individuals who can come into the nation. And I think that's just part of building teams. So I, I wouldn't look at the students that we recruit any different than than our athletic teams or otherwise. Okay. Any other uh, last points? Well, yes, and we have one last question here from David. So there is quite a bit of communication with the secretary. He has a group of lab directors he meets with. But I think he's actually committed to several things which are extremely important, uh, which are um, also on the, on the upside. And I don't mean to say that there aren't downsides, but he's committed to, uh, to for example, high-end computing. So you know, the US is now in a, it's called an arms race for the fastest computers that can not just be fast, but also solve real interesting problems in medicine or physics or what have you. So we're, the, the, in fact, the DOE, as you may have noticed if you looked at the budget, have stepped up their work in, in advanced computing to allow us to be in that game for the foreseeable future. Same thing in cybersecurity, same thing in nuclear. So there are things, you know, there are always things that a, a secretary focuses on. They can't focus on everything. And, and in, in many ways, not to paint a perfectly rosy picture, the secretary is focused on things which are very relevant for our national infrastructure, our national labs, and what they provide for the science infrastructure. So that's on the positive side. So I have, I'm pretty confident given where they've chosen to invest. And then you look at the big machines. You know, you look at Fermilab, the, the amount of investment in Fermilab is remarkably good. So that's basic physics. So all the signs, at least on the ground, whatever's being said at the 10,000 foot level, the signs on the ground are that investment in science and these key competitive elements of what keeps science going are being supported. By the way, let's remind ourselves who was Fermi, right? Going back to the question about immigrants, you know, yeah. Please, please join me in thanking uh, this great panel today, and thank you for being here. Thank you very much.